Hi everybody, I'm Trevor Bognight, a volunteer at the Sumter County Museum, and I'm here with Mr. Charles Broadwell, the museum's curator and archivist, for another episode of From the Collection. And uh, today we have a, a piece of silver, and uh, Mr. Broadwell, why don't you tell us a little bit more about it? Uh, yeah, Trevor, I'm excited about this particular piece that uh, came into museum collection as a, a cane butter knife. And uh, that was because at one time it belonged to a lady named Louise Dukes Kane. Um, but the, the knife was made by a Charleston silversmith, uh, William Carrington. Mm -hmm. Now, he was an uh, unusual character in his own right. He was born in Connecticut, uh, trained in New York as a watchmaker, jeweler, and uh, silversmith. And while he was there, he became friends with Charles Tiffany, uh, who later founded Tiffany & Company. But uh, William Carrington moved to um, Charleston in 1830 and worked with a, a firm in Charleston. And in 1835, he founded his own firm. But the silver that he made was uh, mostly from the period of 1830 to 1835 because he became known more as a jeweler than a silversmith. So that more or less dates this knife, because it's the date for it. Um, but I said he was a man of unusually high character, and he was. Just before the Civil War, he ordered a large shipment of uh, jewelry and watches. Uh, he came in from New York, and of course with the war, he was unable to, to pay for it. Um, but after the war, he gathered up all of his funds that he could, he could find he went to New York and he, with the purpose of paying off his suppliers, which he did with the exception of one. And that one demanded interest because he was late on paying the invoice. Uh, so Mr. Carrington told him he had no more money, but he'd be back the next morning. So he, he, he kept through his promise he was back the next morning, but he went to his friend Charles Tiffany and borrowed the money to pay the interest. So even though he was destitute, himself, he owed nobody. He sold all his debts. See. Um, so he was an unusual man, as I said, but uh, we had to talk about how this came to uh, the museum and what his connection is. Uh, actually, it came such a roundabout way, as I said, uh, started in Charleston, and we actually got it from California. Uh, but the, um, the Carson family, who on this knife at one time, their ties to Sumter was home field plantation. Okay. Uh, they lived in Charleston, had a summer home up here at home field, uh, which was behind Shaw Field Air Force Base, and unfortunately it's burned and gone now. But that was their connection to Sumter. And this knife has had an unusual journey. 1862, uh, Margaret Smythe Dukes uh, was a refugee from Charleston, went to Yorkville. And uh, she had two children and uh, they was expecting a third child, which she had in Yorkville. And uh, along with her was her aunt, um, who was um, uh, Louisa Kane, who owned this particular piece of silver. And the, the story is that when the third child was born, uh, she s said, well, you can't be born with a silver spoon in your mouth, so this butter knife will have to do. <laughs> so that's how it came into that, uh, that family, into the Dukes and Carson family. It actually finally came to the museum by Susan Bryan, who lives in California. She's a Sumter native, but she lives in California now. And she was kind enough to... Uh, donate this this knife some hundred plus years after it was made wow. uh, to uh, the museum. And we're, we're happy to have it because of its Sumter ties and also because it is from a Charleston silversmith, which we're always glad to get pieces from that. So um, we uh, it's a nice addition to our collection and we're grateful to Ms. Uh, Bryan for her of generosity in donating it to the museum. Right. So was Miss Bryan, uh, was she a descendant of yes, Miss King? Right. She was a direct descendant, and this came down uh, through, through her lines. All right.
And All right, so you were talking about the the silversmith, Mr. Carrington. What Did he have some ties to South Carolina, or what? do we know what caused him to move from New York uh, down to Charleston? Well, what prompted him to move was Charleston itself. Charleston was so prosperous at the time he came in the 1830s. Uh, it was a good place uh, to, uh, to set up a business, particularly for silversmiths and uh, jewelers. And he, uh, as I said, he ended up being more of a jeweler than a silversmith, uh, uh, trading in, in watches and, and jewelry. And uh, he was trained in, in New York as a jeweler, but also as an expert in diamonds. Okay. But Charleston was the attraction for the, the market that it provided. I guess those decades right before the Civil War were sort of the boom time, the boom yeah. times in Charleston. Absolutely. Uh, and, and all over South Carolina. All over. Right. It's all, I know a lot of the, the, the big houses and things that you still see are, were built about that time. Correct. All right. We'll just talk a little bit about the piece itself. Uh, I see a, an engraving on it. And uh, without flipping it over, it's, there may be more on the back. Tell me a little bit of, yeah. about it. Well, on the handles engraved cane. That was the, the family that originally had the piece. And on the back it's engraved, it's, uh, you know, it's got the mark on it of W. Carrington for the silversmith that made it. Were there a lot of, uh, you said that there, there were other silversmiths and jewelers in Charleston probably at the time. Were, was, was there like a big competition or a big, uh, was it sort of known uh, for that? Not competition so much as there was just that much of a market for it. Uh, and there was some, some great silversmiths down there, uh, a number of them in Charleston. So yeah, basically anybody from South Carolina that wanted silver, and it would, it would have come from Charleston or been imported because that's that was the center for making it. Mr. Um, Carrington's company in Charleston, uh, I don't suppose that's still around. No, it's not, uh, Trevor. It, it did survive after the war. And, uh, but it ended up closing around in the 1920s, around 1923, I believe. Was uh, it focused on him, or did he have other people working for him or, that you know of? He was the main person in the company. Uh, he may have had uh, a few other employees, but it wouldn't have been many. He, he lived fairly modestly in uh, Charleston. And, of course, uh, I'm not sure who took over the company after he passed away, but it did keep his name attached to the company until it closed and I think that's uh, not from any any particular reason other than it uh, it just closed down. It had been a, it'd been around for a while, yeah, I guess. Yeah. A hundred years almost. The the piece itself would have would it have been very expensive at the time or would it have been something that was available to a lot of people? Uh, actually at the time it had been available to a lot of people. Expensive in, in our terms would not apply to this at all. It, you know, it'd be expensive today if you wanted to put a price on it, but at the time it was made, uh, I mean, it's fairly inexpensive. Is that right? As you, yeah, it's not that everybody had it, but the, the uh, uh, people, uh, middle class on up, used silver uh, quite often. I guess there wasn't really a stainless steel alternative or no. anything like that. <laughs> they didn't have that alternative at the time. All right, well, thank you for telling us about this piece, and uh, we look forward to our next installment of From the Collection. And I think we're going to be talking about a couple of portraits next week or two weeks from now. Yep, that's, that's correct. We'll be doing that, and it's always a pleasure to share part of our collection with the public and uh, make them aware of what we have here at the museum.